Very good. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for this uh, opportunity. Um, yeah, so I am right now in a moment of transition essentially. So let me do uh, a couple of slides of advertising of the places that I am at. So I was a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Complex Systems in Dresden um, uh, as a full-time group, le group leader until last year. And um, uh, I will continue affiliated with Dresden as a part-time group leader for, for another year, basically. And uh, for those of you who have not had a chance to visit, you know, the Max Planck Institute in Dresden is a, is a, is a great place for, you know, uh, various uh, type of scientific activities. It's, you know, if you wish, a kind of German analog of uh, KITP located in the beautiful city of Dresden. So you can propose conferences, you know, take uh, sabbaticals and, you know, it's great stuff and, and great facilities to, to, to have lots of um, interesting scientific interactions there. And so I just moved a couple of a month ago to Leipzig, which is very close to Dresden. Um, so if you are in Dresden by any chance, please let me know. It will be great to have you visit Leipzig as well. It's just about an hour by train. Uh, so I'm at the Institute of Theoretical Physics there at the University of Leipzig, um, which is a place with a, a great history. So it's the place where Heisenberg used to be a professor and where he, you know, was during basically his golden years, okay, during the time in which he won the Nobel Prize and he trained some of the pioneers of um, solid state physics where we were PhD students of him in Leipzig. Okay, so the talk is divided basically into two parts. Okay, so the first part, I want to do a review of uh, what one could call the traditional spin on Fermi surface state. Okay, it's a type of spin liquid. I want to review what it is, what are its properties. And then the second part, which is the part related to more directly to alpha ruthenium chloride will be uh, uh, the introduction inspired by these experiments uh, uh, described by, by Puangong of a variant of this traditional spin on Fermi surface state that I call the pseudoscalar spin on Fermi surface state, okay? Um, and so I want to uh, begin by uh, doing a little bit of, um, let's say, philosophical preaching, and uh, just to 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 mention that I, I feel that a, a, our understanding of a strongly interacting gapless phases of matter is, is still in its infancy. We have a sort of insular understanding of some phases of, of matter, of strongly interacting gaplets of phases of matter, but we are very far from understanding really the entire landscape, okay? So we, maybe we understand some islands like Landau Fermi liquids very well, we have a Landau level, and uh, we're trying to find this new territory like the spin on Fermi surface state. But what I will try to show you is that probably in alpha ruthenium chloride, even though we, we were trying to sail for this spin on Fermi surface state, we, we actually landed in a slightly different place, okay? That it's gonna be this pseudoscalar spin on Fermi surface. Okay, so the, the spin on Fermi surface state is a state that was introduced by Phil Anderson uh, many years ago. It's a spin charge separated state uh, that can exist in dimensions two and higher in which essentially the electron breaks into two particles. Okay, it fractionalizes into some fermion called the spinon and a boson called the chargon. So the spinon carries the spin of the electron that I denote by this sub-index sigma. And the chargon is basically a, a featureless boson. Okay? And a convenient uh, uh, language to understand this state is the, the, the slave boson a representation of the electrons which was actually invented by, by peers, by one of the organizers. And so basically in this parton representation of the electron, you take the electron operator and write it as a product of 
the spin on operator and the charge on operator. The spin on carries the spin, okay, at every lattice side. And then in this enlarged uh, Hilbert space of partons, only those states that satisfy uh, the constraint that the number of uh, chargons equals the number of spinons equals the number of electrons at each side are, are physical, okay? And so the idea is that when you have a, a, a lattice, okay, when you have this uh, um, uh, a lattice uh, that is half filled, in which you have uh, one electron uh, per side in average, um, uh, then the bosons will be at a filling in which they can form a trivial mod insulator. Okay, the, the bosons, you know, by this constraint, there will be one boson per side, so they can freeze form a, 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 a mod insulator, whereas the spinons will be in a half field uh, band, okay, because they have the spin index. And so they, they will form a Fermi liquid. And so the spin on Fermi surface state is basically this state in which the spinons are forming uh, uh, this Fermi liquid. And so the idea in a sense is that the, 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 the mean field state is basically a Fermi C of these spinons times a mod insulator for the chargons times some Gadswiller projection that basically eliminates out of this mean field state, all the, all the states that are violating this um, constraint. And so that will give you some idea of the physical uh, wave function for this spin on Fermi surface state. Uh, crucially, uh, this state has an emergent photon or an emerging U1 gauge field uh, that it's ultimately responsible for essentially enforcing these constraints, okay? So, so, so you should oh. a, a picture that the spinon and the chargon are always in a sense strongly interacting, strongly coupled, okay? with this wiggly line here that depicts the, the, the gauge field. And in a sense, this gauge field forces the spinon and the chargon to, to, to move together. So every time you, 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 you act on the state by some, a local operator that is basically moving electrons, okay, you will have, you know, some motion of the spinon and the chargon as, as, as bound objects, in a sense. However, the phases that they acquire when they hop can be different, okay? The only constraint that you have is that the, the, the addition of the phase that the spinon and the chargon are acquiring equals the phase that the electron acquires when, when it hops between lattice sites, okay? And so basically the, the emergent gauge field that I denote here by little a, so capital A is like the physical gauge field, is the, the gauge field that is giving rise to the phase that the electron is acquiring, okay? Uh, uh, so the, the, the emergent gauge field that is denoted by this little a, uh, basically keeps track of what is the phase difference that the spinon and the chargon acquire. Their sum needs to be equal to the one that the electron acquires, okay? And so, you know, there will be emergent electric fields, emergent magnetic fields associated with these uh, gauge fields, these emerging uh, gauge fields that I denote here by, by uh, lower lowercase e and lowercase b, and capital again refer to the physical ones, to the electromagnetic fields, the physical ones. Um, and so, what happens basically is when, when the spin on hops around a plaquette, when it completes a, a, a closed loop, you know, when you have a closed loop in the, in the lattice, like a plaquette, uh, by following the same rule that the, the phase is basically splitting in this way among the spin on and the chargon, you will basically uh, 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 convince yourself that the, the, the spin on and the chargon can separately experience a different magnetic field than the one that you are applying on the electron. So here in this part, I'm imagining, you know, you have like a two dimensional lattice and you ju you're just applying a magnetic field that is uh, out, of, out of, you know, orthogonal to the, to the lattice, out of the plane in this, in this cartoon, okay? So the physical magnetic field in this triangular plaquette splits into some uh, magnetic field, some emergent magnetic field that the spin on sees and then the chargon just sees whatever is the remnant so that you still make up the full uh, field that the, the electron is seen, okay? And so it, what turns out to happen, and I'll try to explain this intuitively in the next slide, but just to first give you sort of the, 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 the idea is uh, uh, what turns out to happen is that when you apply 
a magnetic field on your system, a physical magnetic field on your sample, the spin on Fermi surface develops an expectation value of this emergent little b, okay? It's, what happens is just that the expectation value is not exactly the physical magnetic field, okay? This is again, this little b is the one that the spin on is experiencing in average, but it's just reduced by some fraction, okay? That is some ratio of the susceptibilities of the uh, spin on and the charge on of their diamagnetic susceptibilities. So as a consequence, you know, the, the spin ons actually experience Lorentz force in some sense when you apply the physical field. Again, this is the Lorentz force associated with this little b, okay? But they, they will have a cyclotron energy associated with this little b. They will have Hall effect. And they will have, you know, quantum oscillations because they have a Fermi surface. The period is not the same that you have because, you know, this prefactor, you know, the, the one that you would measure if you just do like a usual experimental plot as a function of, of one over the physical field, then you will measure some period that is not exactly the, 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 the Fermi surface area of the spin, but the Fermi surface area divided by this uh, uh, number alpha, okay? So how is it that the spin can have Lorentz force and experience magnetic field? Okay, let me give you like a very intuitive way to, to see this uh, in, in a few lines, okay? The key is to realize that the electric currents the physical electric current, the current of electrons must equal the current of the spinons and must equal the current of chargons. This uh, constraint ultimately comes from the fact that, you know, the, 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 the local operators are always hopping the spinon and the chargon together. You know, in sort of this cartoon that I was putting here, the, 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 the hopping always happens together. So they move together, so they have the same currents, okay? Current, you know, if I just, put magnetic field on my sample, I am not taking current in and out of the sample, then the current can be written down as the curl of a magnetization. And so you can convince them yourself then that the magnetization, the physical magnetization of the electron must equal the magnetization of the spin on and must equal the magnetization of the chargons. So this is just the common M. And so just by writing down basically linear response for each of the two components, the spin-on and the charge-on, you, you will have the magnetization equals the susceptibility of the spin-on times the fraction of the field that the spin-on is experiencing, which is this little b, and, 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 and similarly must equal the, the susceptibility uh, of the charge-on times. Is he, can I ask different. a question? Sure. Yeah, when you say the, uh, the, the currents are the same, do you mean without multiplying by the electric charge or? Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is yes, just yes. a number Thanks current? For the clarification. Yeah, so here I'm viewing them as a particle number current. You could view number without, current. So then so how, without, without the E, without the how, E. How does that give you equal magnetizations? Oh, magnetizations, again, it's just missing the E in a sense. Magnetization, I'm just viewing it as, a, as something it's that is just encoding the same information. So the currents via this equation of J equals curl M. But so, so yeah. if I can also add to that. So if this were a spin liquid made of neutral spins, such as uh, a cold atom system, you wouldn't write this equation. Um, if it's made out of cold atoms, you know, this particle number C, right? So you could, I can write as particle number, you know, if I have a probe magnetic field of some sort that I engineer for the cold atoms, you know, if I apply some kind of rotation of the lattice, or something that engineers a, a magnetic field that is acting on the physical particles of the lattice, then I would have an analog of this. But if the if all the correlation functions and excitations of the spin liquid made from cold atoms and made from uh, electrons were the same, how would it know that it was different? Hey, uh, I don't know what you mean. I'm trying to say it's the same, right? So. Uh, here again, these currents, you could picture them as particle number currents. And what I'm trying to say is if you apply a physical magnetic field that couples to the physical electrons, you know, via pyrrole substitution, mm -hmm. then you, you will see that there is some emergent fraction of that field that is coupling via, you know, pyrrole substitution to the spin on and then the remnant will be coupling via pile substitution to the chargon. Go on, yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you just equate these two lines, right? Chi spin on B equals chi chargon B minus B, then you get this equation that I was writing before. 
So it gives you the proportionality constant uh, between the emergent field that the spin on is experiencing and the one experience the, the, the physical field that you apply. Okay. Uh, um, um, yeah, into, so, so, sorry, yeah. since, since you've already been interrupted by questions, may I ask a question to the slide just to clarify? Yeah, go ahead. So when you write down uh, J as being a curl of M, right? Mm -hmm. That that's in some sense like Ampere's law, right? Or if you wish, it's one of the Maxwell equation. No, no, right? this is the definition. This is a definition. Well, okay, you could think of it as a definition, but you could also say that curl B is equal in a side. You haven't written any Maxwell M equation K. here, right? So this is just a different way of writing currents. I'm trying to say basically magnetizations so encode the same information as currents. Good. Okay. So, so th that's fine. I, I, the, I guess what I was, what I wanted to ask is this. So, how should I think of magnetization coming from both charge ions and spinners? Um, you could argue that the charge ions are charged, and therefore no, you should I think, would have. You should think that there is only one physical magnetization, mm -hmm. which is the electric magnetization, the magnetization of the electron, right? And the right. electron is, you know, when it moves in a loop. And you compute the current of electron is the same current of these two bound objects, right? And you know the charge in a sense how you assign charges to them is actually a bit ambiguous. The typical convention is you put all the charge into the charge and, and view the spin on as neutral. Precisely, which is why it I would. Is, but you could split it in different ways. You could split it into halves. In the end, that's just keeping track of you know what is the total charge of the of the local object, which is the electron. Is the, the only thing that makes sense as a physical quantity is what is the total charge of the local object, which is the electron, and how you split it among the two partons is a matter of convention essentially. Oh, well, that I'm fine as long as you say your spinners are charged. Then then yes, fine. My, Again, my it's, I'm not saying yeah. that. I'm, I'm I'm trying to say it's a bit of an ambiguity to assign a charge to a spin. The only thing that it's you know, gauge invariant, uh, physical and ambiguous question is what is the charge of the combined object? Okay. okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to slow you down. No, no, that's good. Those are good questions. Very good. So, you know, the spin on has been controversial for many years. Uh, there is uh, some uh, uh, important evidence that it might be present in organic materials. Um, there's still some controversy there. Since I mentioned quantum oscillations, you know, this also uh, points out why the spin on Fermi surface is a natural candidate state every time you have an insulator, a strong insulating insulator that displays quantum oscillations and that has also other characteristics of a metal such as having a linear thermal cold conduct, uh, thermal conductivity in temperature like the mixed balance insulators, but that's not the story that I want to focus on here. And just maybe to close this a, a brief a review of properties of the traditional spin on Fermi surface state, I just want to say that, you know, in addition to oscillations, there is other things that it can display that resemble a metal. Okay, so the, this state is very interesting because in a sense it's an insulator, but in some aspects it resembles a metal, especially in how it responds to magnetic fields. So it has some analog of cyclotron resonance, which is something we pointed out a few years ago. And also it has some, re, uh, the magnetic noise that emanates from, from, from the quantum fluctuations of the spin liquid also resemble those of a metal. And if maybe there is anybody in the audience who has um, interest in MB centers, uh, one could prove this magnetic noise with MB centers placed close to the spin liquid. There's some specific prediction for how it would behave. Uh, and it's sort of related in a sense to, 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 to this story that the, um, um, the, the magnetic fluctuations are similar to those in a metal, okay? But let me move on to, to try to cover um, ruthenium chloride, okay? Because the idea in a sense is what I just told you is the story of the traditional spin on Fermi surface state, okay? The Anderson spin on Fermi surface state. So I want to introduce a new kind of spin on Fermi surface state that is inspired by these uh, recent experiments in alpha ruthenium chloride. Okay, so, you know, already, Puan gave a very nice introduction to various properties of alpha ruthenium chloride. For my purposes, you know, it's just a, a honeycomb lattice with a, a spin moments. And a, really the story, you, this relates to some que a question that Pierce was asking. For the story that I'm gonna tell, you can think that the underlying model is an actual, actually a Heisenberg model. There is no electron, okay? It's just a spins, local moments. Okay, at each side, you know, some kind of underlying Heisenberg model, you know, K plus gamma plus J or some model of that sort for, for, for ruthenium chloride. Okay, that's, 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 the, that's the 
kind of Hilbert space, underlying Hilbert space in which my story will be couched. And uh, okay, so there is these uh, you know amazing experiments uh, that uh, um, Puan was showing, just showing. And so uh, just to review them uh, briefly. So when you apply, um, this is a layered material. I'm going to assume it's 2D. So for my purposes, it's just a 2D material. Um, and so when you apply field in plane, for example, in this uh, A direction, uh, uh, initially you have an antiferromagnet that is eventually destroyed and a region appears in between, which is the presumed spin liquid. And eventually uh, at higher fields, you have a paramagnetic state. And in this uh, uh, presumed spin liquid region, what is seen uh, by uh, the, the group of uh, Princeton, and it, as Juan mentioned, has been also seen by uh, uh, the group in Stuttgart, um, are some very clear uh, uh, oscillations of the longitudinal uh, 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 conductivity. Okay. The thermal hold for me is a kind of secondary, to be honest. Okay, if you even look at the numbers, the thermal hold is ten, you know, three or four orders of magnitude smaller than than the longitudinal thermal hold. For me, the main phenomenon are the oscillations, but the thermal hold will be important. But the only thing that I will use the thermal hold for is to pay attention to when it's zero and when it's not zero. Okay, it's just it will be a very good guidance about symmetries of the problem, okay? But it's value and so on, it's not crucial. And I want to again emphasize this tiny amount of thermal hole. The huge part of the signal is really the longitudinal, uh, hole of, uh, the longitudinal conductivity that is displaying this very big and you know, clear to the naked eye oscillations, okay? And as Puan said, you know, when you plot them as one over B, they, they, they follow a straight line, the maxima, as one would expect naively for metals or like should make up the has analysis of oscillations of metals. So could this be the spin on Fermi surface state? As you know, as I was just trying to argue in the first part of the talk, the spin on Fermi surface state has these emerging gauge fields that allow to have, you know, some, 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 some magnetic field that the spin ons experience when you apply a, a physical magnetic field to the, to the system. So could it, could, could these oscillations be somehow an indication of, this, uh, of the presence of this traditional or Anderson spin on Fermi surface state that I uh, uh, was describing in the first part of the talk? Well, something is already obviously strange for purposes of trying to make this story consistent with the traditional spin on Fermi surface state. And is, as you know, uh, uh, Pierce was emphasizing in this question that the field is applied in plane, okay? It's not an out of plane field. The story that I mentioned the first half of the talk was really always imagining that the field was out of plane. Everything is orbital, right? I didn't even have the Seman effect in the first part of the talk. So everything is orbital. Uh, uh, so it's an in plane field. So how can an in plane field give rise to some kind of average out of plane field for the spin-ons? Moreover, you know, when they have the, the experimentalists tilt the field um, out of the plane, so when they, for example, change the parallel component while having some fixed, you know, component, component out of the plane, the, the period appears to depend only on the projection. The, the oscillations appear to depend only on the projection of the field onto the plane. They don't care about the out of plane a component of the magnetic field, which is very strange, right? Um, But you know, you could say, you know, you could say maybe it's a still a spin on Fermi surface state. There is just some very strange and isotropic coupling between the emergent field and the applied field. After all, they are just essentially some kind of vector. So they could have some tensor that is relating them, but it's maybe very anisotropic. You might, if you want to still rescue, let's say the traditional spin on Fermi surface hypothesis, you could try to imagine that. But there is something that very sharply tells you that there is something wrong with the traditional spin on Fermi surface hypothesis, which is the symmetry of the Hall effect, okay? Which I want to uh, uh, emphasize in this slide, okay? And here it's important to pay attention to the axis. So again, A axis is this red uh, uh, arrow here and the B axis is this green arrow here. So the important thing is uh, when the uh, 
experimentalists apply the in-plane field along the A axis and the B axis, they all see quantum oscillations. So the quantum oscillations are, are seen for both A and B axis, okay? Here, B axis is green, A axis red. But there is a key difference between the two axes with respect to the Hall effect. So along the A axis, there is Hall effect. So when the in-plane field is along the A axis, there is clear Hall effect. But along the B axis, the Hall effect is essentially zero within the, the experimental uncertainty. But, you know, if I make a hypothesis in which I say, you know, the spin-ons are experiencing some average emergent magnetic field, that magnetic field mass would need to at the same time give rise to quantum oscillations or to some sort of Landau quantization, but no Hall effect. So no, no Lorentz force for the spin also when, when it's applied along the B axis. So that, that, that is an inconsistency, okay? So how can we resolve that inconsistency? So the, 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 the key, okay, is that different axes have different uh, symmetries, different point group symmetries. So when the field is applying along the B axis, this mirror plane, okay, coming out of the, the screen that is denoted here by this dashed line is respected because the fields are, you know, pseudo vectors, so they are even under mirrors. So this mirror remains there and mirrors forbid the whole effect, you know, mirrors turn clockwise motion into counterclockwise motion. So there should be no whole effect if you have this mirror present. So that will explain why there is no whole effect. And clearly when you apply the field along the A axis, this mirror is broken because again, the fields are, are pseudo vectors. So the, 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 the component that is parallel to the mirror plane is reversed by <clears> the <throat> mirror operation. So this is completely consistent with, with what is seen in experiments with, with regard to the presence and absence of Hall effect along the two axes. But you know, this mirror itself would make the emergent field of the traditional spin on Fermi surface state also odd. You know, the emergent field is like locally gauging variant quantity, something physical, okay? So you can make sense of it, of its transformation laws, just as you make sense of transformation laws of any physical quantity, like a magnetization or something. So, you know, the emergent field of the traditional spin on Fermi surface state is odd under this mirror. It, it cannot exist if the mirror is preserved, but at the same time, I need to preserve the mirror in order to explain the vanishing Hall effect. So how can this all work? You can rescue the spin-on hypothesis by changing the way mirrors act on the spin-ons. So let me first give you the key idea and I'll then tell you how to do this more precisely with patterns, okay? So the key idea is to make the hypothesis that this mirror particle hole conjugates the spin on. Okay, let's assume that if I have a spin on creation operator at this side, then I mirror it, I map it to this side, but in addition, there is some form of particle hole conjugation. So the gauge charge of the spin on number is odd under the mirror. It's very different from electric charge. You know, I don't have a negative charge. If I apply a mirror, it's still gonna be a negative charge. So the gauge charge of these spin ons will behave very different from electric charge of ordinary electrons. If you have that kind of transformation of the gauge charge under mirrors, then it's easy to convince yourself that the transformation laws of the uh, magnetic field in this kind of uh, uh, quantum electrodynamics would be opposite to the ones of the usual magnetic field. So the magnetic field would be a scalar with respect to this dash line, the, the, the out of plane magnetic field, okay? The orbital magnetic field that the spinons are experiencing would, would be a scalar. So it would not be forbidden by this mirror. And then if you have that magnetic field that, <coughs> that will explain the quantum oscillations. So how is it that you can have at the same time zero hole effect even though you have no magnetic field? Well, the, the, the idea basically is that because the point group operation particle hole conjugates the spin on, then if you have some kind of Fermi surface of, this, of, of the spin-ons, okay, after you apply the point group operation, that Fermi surface of particles must be mapped to a Fermi surface of holes. So you necessarily have to have at least two pockets, okay, of spin-ons, one particle-like and one hole-like that are mapped into each other by this mirror. 
but they are, you know, they are perfectly compensated, okay? And they are perfectly balanced by the point group symmetry. So in the presence of the average magnetic field of the emergent magnetic field, you know, the particle like spin on say will experience clockwise motion, whereas the whole like spin on will experience counterclockwise motion. So there will be zero uh, uh, net hole effect. But this does not prohibit the fact that this, you know, this pocket will land out quantizing the presence of this magnetic field. So you will still have the land out quantization of the two pockets of the particle like pocket and the whole pocket. And you know, as those Landau levels move through the chemical potential, you will get quantum oscillations as usual. Okay, so that's the key idea, but how to understand it more precisely with partons, okay? So the problem is that this late boson parton representation forces the spin-on to transform under point group in the same way as the electron. And that in a sense is some, something that you're doing by hand without realizing. There is other possibilities, okay? Is what I'm trying to say that in which you don't make the, the spin-on transforming the same way as the electron. Especially, you know, when you're deep in the mod regime, when you have a very good insulator, there is two ways to represent uh, mirrors, okay? One is sort of the usual action on electrons. So imagine this is like a site, okay? Um, each ball represents, you know, the two states that you could have in a site for the spin on, the, the, the spin up or the spin down. And whether the ball is black means the state is filled and if it's white, it means it's empty. Right, so the usual action would be, I just reverse the spin of the two, you know, single particle states that I'm keeping there for the spinning at this site. I reverse the spins. But conversely, you know, if I just do the following, I remove the particle from the state that is occupied and fill the one that is empty. So I'm doing a particle hole conjugation, you know, removing the particle from the one occupied and filling the one that is empty. I have the same physical transformation. You see here? I went from this state that was filled that had spin down to spin up through the mirror. And here I removed the particle from the filled state and put it in the, in, the, in the one that was initially empty. So physically I'm doing the same operation, but I can represent the operation in two ways. When I'm deep in the mode regime that I am in this, I have this constraint of only one particle per site, okay? And so you can do this very explicitly with Abricos of Schwinger fermions, okay? By the way, these abricots of Schrodinger fermions are the same that allow to exactly solve the, the, the Kitaev model after you split them in Majorana. So this is very, you know, this, this is equivalent to doing Majorana. So just the complex fermion version. Um, so you, you, you can have an electron-like representation in which the mirror will just act on the electron just, you know, by flipping spin. So it's a type of should have been sigma you know, with the usual way it acts, mirrors on spins, but you can have this other transformation that is particle hole conjugating the spin on. And what you can convince yourself is that the spin bilinears, which are the physical operators in this, in this, in this, in this, uh, uh, because of Schwinger uh, representation, they transform in the same way under these two operations, okay? So these two different representations of the mirror on the action of the spin ons lead to the same physical, you know, symmetry of the actual physical objects, which are the spins. Question? Yeah. Um, if the system uh, has a normal SU2 spin, then it will have an, a local SU2 gauge symmetry. Yeah, yeah. Which means that these two statements are really the same. This is related to a bigger SU2 symmetry. Yeah, I had some slide later about it, but there's some local so this gauge. Is, this, this, is, this is just saying, uh, under, under the gauge transformation, it makes no difference. I guess you agree with yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. They are, they are, they differ by a gauge transformation, which belongs to this larger SU two group. Good, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, you know, you can have these two different uh, ways of implementing the uh, pa uh, particle hole con. Sorry, the mirror on the spin ons. But you know, the key in a sense is that when you construct a mean field state for the spin -ons. So I mean, field state, you basically can parameterize by just, you know, having some tight binding model for the spin -ons, and then whatever is the ground state of the tight binding model, you got Swiller projected to avoid double occupancies. But you can convince yourself is if you implement the mirrors differently on your mean field state, you will have distinct physical states after the got Swiller projection, okay? So even though they lead to the same transformation loss of the physical spins, when you enforce these different transformation laws on the spin-ons, you get different physical states. 
after Gatzuller projection. In particular, you can convince yourself very, very explicitly, you know, dealing with the with the transformations of the Gatzuller projected wave functions of the physical Gatzuller projected wave function that these hoppings of the mean field state uh, that you have for the spinons when you dress them with a with a vector potential with a via by a pyrrole substitution you can convince yourself that the magnetic field associated with this transformation law the electron like transformation law will be odd under this mirror whereas the magnetic field associated with this a, a particle hole like mirror will be even okay uh, yeah, so as Pierce was asking, you know, how to understand this in, as part of the larger SU2 uh, gauge group of the uh, recourse of um, partons. Uh, so basically the way to understand it is that the, 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 the spins, the recourse of fermions have a local gauge transformation, which is pure particle hole. So this G here doesn't involve any mirrors. And you can glue this gauge transformation to various physical symmetries to swap them from acting as they would do in electrons to acting in some kind of particle whole way, okay? So in a sense, if you want to be, you know, a bit more precise, what I'm trying to say here is that these two mirrors, they are just different projective symmetry group implementations of the same underlying symmetry in the same sense of, you know, the projective symmetry group representations of, of Shaogan uh, work. Um, they are just, you know, within this larger SU2 group, different projective symmetry group representations within this larger SU2 group. So, you know, then you can, I focus only in, on the mirror, but you can do the analysis for all the symmetries of alpha ruthenium chloride to try to construct, you know, mean field states that basically satisfy all the symmetries. So for example, I here list all the symmetries of alpha ruthenium chloride and the, uh, I chose some particular implementation of, a, of, a, of a symmetry just to illustrate basically. And so under the mirrors, the emergent field is, is even and the uh, whole conductivity is odd. So this one will be zero and this one will be allowed and you can construct some, you know, mean field state of the spinons. What I believe, and for this, I don't have very strong evidence. This is kind of my, 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 my guess is that presumably these spinons have if there is a spin on Fermi surface state, then you will have to have these two pockets, a particle-like pocket and a hole-like pocket. And presumably they are centered at the endpoints so that they are connected by the weight vector uh, that is associated with the uh, uh, instability towards the antiferromagnet. So in this way, you can explain why the spin liquid is so proximate to becoming unstable to antiferromagnetism, some kind of, you know, condensation of a spin on particle hole pairs connected by this wave vector will lead to, to, to an antiferromagnet. And you can um, uh, uh, also make predictions. So this, this picture is not complete, you know, pure theory. You can also make predictions. So I have some prediction that is basically if you apply in plane field along this direction, there should be oscillations of the magnetization of the in plane magnetization. Okay, which is quite, quite, quite strange for this planar material. I don't have too much time, but just to mention uh, briefly, uh, one tricky aspect is that whether these states confine or not at low energies, and uh, uh, they might confine at low energies. So if somebody is interested in these more subtle aspects, I could comment on this, but this could be related to some of the experimental observations that report that uh, the oscillations seem to disappear, seem to start disappearing as they lower energy, but this is still, I think, something that is not completely settled. Just to give a final kind of picture of, you know, everything I did was partons. There was nothing too, too, too very explicit of what is the meaning microscopically of this magnetic field on what I said so far. So I want to give you here a, a picture of what it is more concretely, and this is something I'm working at the moment. So, so it's still sort of unpublished work, but you know, how to understand, so for people who doubt that this is possible, I'm, I wanna give you an example that just proves beyond any reasonable doubt, I think that this is just a very reasonable state of matter. So, you know, with an idea and example, is let's ignore ruthenium chloride for a moment, okay? So if you take one dimensional jordan Bigner fermions, you know, the jordan Bigner fermion, whether there is a fermion at a given site or not, is just depends on the spin. If, if the spin is up, 
you have a fermion. If the spin is down, there is no fermion, right? That's the mapping. But that means that the gauge charge of the, or the, the particle number of the Jordan Bigner fermion is the spin along the set direction. So the particle number of the Jordan Bigner fermion, particle hole conjugates under mirrors naturally. You can put Jordan Bigner fermions in a ring. And you can convince yourself that very explicitly, just with Jordan Bigner fermions, which you know, people who, who have experience with this, you know, there is no reasonable doubt that there is a magnetic field in this ring, and that magnetic field will be even under this mirror, okay, for Jordan Bigner fermions. So, what is the magnetic field of a Jordan Bigner fermion? So, you know, if you remember the paper by Patrick, the magnetic field of the usual spin is some kind of triple product of three spins measuring some kind of spin chirality. This magnetic field cannot be chiral, right? Because it has to be even under mirrors. So the magnetic field that Jordan Bigner fermions experience is a type of correlation that measures the pitch, the pitch for the uh, 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 state to try to make a spiral. Okay, the, the, the kind of a spiral pitch that the magnet is making in the XY plane around this. this. So the magnetic field really measures a kind of a spy, the pitching of the spiral, the magnetic field, the meaning of the magnetic field is, you know, how fast is this, the, 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 the spiral processing in real space? So maybe this has something, if this has, if this more microscopic version of Jordan Bigner fermions has something to do with this in physics, maybe this magnetic field, you should view it as some kind of short distance correlation uh, for the system that is trying to make some kind of spiral, okay? Anyhow, so with this, I I'd like to close. So just to summarize, uh, uh, there is clear oscillations of kappa XX accompanied by absence of kappa XY when the magnetic field is along the directions that preserve the mirrors uh, within some intermediate region that indicate the presence of uh, uh, pseudo-scalar spin on Fermi surface state. And the idea basically is that this is a state in which you have a compensated spin on particles with spin on holes, uh, but the magnetic field doesn't break the mirror. So you have you can have Landau quantization with zero hole effect. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you, Indy, for a beautiful talk. Uh, and thank you for leaving some time. I, I think uh, next uh, talk will be delayed by uh, 15 minutes. Uh, so we have time for discussions, Andre. Yes. Indy, wonderful talk. Um, I, I, have a, I have a question. Let me start with the simpler one. So most of the discussion centered around how you represent the action of the mirror, right? And how you could do it in a particle hole symmetric way or the other way of doing it, correct? Um, however, if you apply field along A, that, as you pointed out, breaks the mirror symmetry. So all of the discussion above seems to only apply for when the field applied along B. Yeah, in a sense, B is the direction that is more constraining because, you know, when the experiment along B, I need to explain at the same time why I have quantum oscillations, but no whole effect. Whereas right, but, along but, A, uh, I just need to explain, you know, why is the whole effect maybe small, right? But it's, there's nothing sharp, right? So in a sense, B is more constraining than A. Right, but would you not agree that if you apply uniform field or if it was a ferromagnet with all the spins pointing along A, then strictly speaking, the crystallographic mirror is no longer the symmetry of this magnetic system. Yeah, so when the field is along A, mm -hmm. there is no mirror. And that's why there is no right. effect. Right, but then why would I care about how you represent mirror as a particle hole if, if the whole symmetry isn't even present in the system? Does that not disturb you? That like most of the analysis hinges on how your operators, this abricos of pseudofermions, transform on the mirror. Well, if mirror is not there, how no, does so this analysis scale on? As I, as I was trying to, to mention, mention Andre, the whole effect mm -hmm. is kind of secondary. So the whole effect, when you look at the numbers, is you know four orders of magnitude smaller than kappa x y. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the kappa x x. So it's okay. not. It's, it doesn't seem uh, um, unreasonable for me to think that when you apply a perturbation that breaks a symmetry, something mm -hmm. that is allowed by that symmetry just turns on, right? It's a mm -hmm. small whole effect when you think about it. So you can okay. view it that way that the field along A is just a symmetry, mm -hmm. a weak symmetry breaking perturbation that is allowing something that otherwise would be zero. I see, I see. Okay, and may I ask my, my second question, which is that, um, 
So if you start with the pseudo fermion language, right, you don't, you no longer need the argument about charge ions, right? As you pointed out, you could just start with pure spin ions, yeah. because of pseudo fermions, if you will. Um, and so in that language, you know, how do I understand that there should be uh, quantum oscillations? Like it seems that the previous part of the story, which might apply beautifully to, I don't know, samarium hexaboride, here there are no charge ions to speak of. Like how yeah. I seem to miss how yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah how you get the oscillations, especially, and this is Pierce's comment, how do you get Landau levels if the field is not perpendicular yeah. to the plane? Yeah, so, you know, I, 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 I should say, uh, um, uh, just to, to be a bit more, you know, sort of a disclaimer, I don't have a precise picture of what is the uh, microscopic meaning of the magnetic field in alpha ruthenium chloride, okay? So I just have at the moment, let's say something that looks like a possibility, okay? So, but, but, but the picture is, is as follows, okay? So I am imagining that ultimately the physical field is coupling to the spins via a semant term. There is no pile substitution. The physical field is, so you have, you had your, you know, uh, Kitayev plus gamma model plus J or something. And then all that happened when you added the physical field is some semant term, maybe with some anisotropic, you know, mu factor or something, but, but just mm -hmm. semant, okay? Now, this is what the part that I was trying to hint at at the end, although I went too fast, you know? So what is the physical field? So what is the physical field of Jordan and Bigner fermions in a ring? This is what I was trying to say. The, the physical field of Jordan Wigner fermions in a ring is just a correlation. It's just some kind of correlation, okay, among the spins. So it's a correlation in which the XY projection of the spins, you know, just picture these spins as if they were classical rotors. So they have a well-defined mm -hmm. XY projection, okay? So if they all point in the same direction, there is no twisting. Now imagine that they sort of start tilting as you rotate around this ring that I have here, okay? And so that they are trying to spiral, okay? So the magnetic field of Jordan Bigner fermions, it's a strength, is just the pitch of that spiral. Mm -hmm. So you see magnetic field just has a very concrete meaning in terms of some kind of correlation function that the spins are trying to establish. So, so what you need to explain is, or what I need to explain, or anybody who wants to make this really more microscopically solid, eventually for alpha ruthenium chloride is, why is it that applying this in-plane field, which, which is ultimately just coupling to the spins through a semant coupling, induces some type of correlation on the system that is like a spiral and its change of its magnitude is like the change of a pitch of that spiral. Okay? Yeah, yeah, I follow, I see. Yes. So, so it's very different from the first part of the story, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Great, very, very nice talk, and uh, and and I applaud your um, your courage in trying to solve this uh, paradoxical problem. Um, uh, but I put it to you that it's not a Zeeman coupling that's driving this physics; it's an orbital coupling. Um, uh, if if it were a Zeeman coupling, uh, what well, one well, we could be presumably test if it were one or the other. But the fact that the physics obeys so beautifully the uh, lifshitz kosevich behavior is a sign of underlying semi-classical physics of some form of quasi-particle, right? And so clearly, I agree you've got some room of maneuver if you make the field Zeeman. But if you acquiesce and say it's an orbital coupling, then you have to have interlayer motion of the underlying electrons, simply because I can choose a gauge in which the vector potential is purely Z dependent and only, uh, so, sorry, is only pointing in the Z direction out of the plane, right? That, mm -hmm. that gauge still has a curl, which has a field pointing in plane, right? Yeah. And clearly the electrons will only feel it, the microscopic yeah. electrons that you've integrated out to produce your spin liquid will only feel it if they, have interlayer motion. And so I think it's rather important to establish whether the coupling that is driving this physics is Zeeman coupling 
or whether it's orbital coupling microscopically. I think that's yeah. important to know because that yeah, will so, affect, affect the so thing. You know, and one yeah. way to do that presumably would be literally to look for torque, to measure the magnetic torque. If there's a physical, uh, I know that's Pana said that's very difficult to do, but if there were a physical current uh, giving rise to an oscillating magnetization in, in, in the A or B directions, then that would indicate that you've got a coupling to the orbital degrees of freedom. Yeah. So let me say a couple of comments on what you said, uh, Pierre. So first of all, the dependence of the amplitude, I would not say is Lipschitz Kosevich. I would say it's just something that, you know, has some very simple trend. Actually, when you look at how it is shown in the experiment, what, 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 what uh, uh, this plot is showing is the ratio of the amplitude of the oscillation divided by the background. The amplitude alone is actually going down with temperature. You see, this is higher temperature, the red one. The black one is lower temperature. The but it's the thermal amplitude, conductivity, so that's not so surprising. No, no, but Lipschitz Kosevich would just look like this, you know, would look like it would rise if it was a metal. Okay. The amplitude is no, no, going no, no, down no, no. with temperature. For the magnetization, but you've got to take into account the, the temperature factors for the thermal conductivity. No, 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 no. Like you just, if you divide by kappa over T, let's say, mm -hmm. just divide by kappa over T, Lipschitz Kosevich will predict some increase of the magnetization with, with lowering temperature. But here you're dividing by kappa over T and it's still going down. The amplitude of the oscillations, I don't, I would not say it's Lipschitz Kosevich. And that's part of the discussion. The, the Stuttgart group is trying to emphasize a bit more that the oscillations go down with temperature. Mm -hmm. The amplitude of the oscillation is very complex still, I would say, just to put it, let, let's, uh, you know, without saying too much, okay? Um, second, what you said that, there is one important point, I think, on what you said, maybe that the, the you know, this, you still have this, you know, sort of a de linear dependence of one over B for the, for the uh, periods, you know, which is just traditional, uh, you know, Shudnikov de Haas type of analysis, right? So how, how can, you know, a Seman field have anything to do with this Shudnikov de Haas analysis of the Fermi surface, right? So this is part of what I was trying to, 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 to mention to, to Andre. In the end, all I need to, assume is that there is a linear relation between the emergent field and the applied field. I, I don't have the explanation, but just to tell you what, what I need to eventually be able to, to produce, okay? What the explanation needs to be able to produce is that in this kind of scenario is that there is some kind of correlation like the spiral correlation that I was mentioning, okay? That just grows linearly with the applied field within some here, range. It's not a huge range, you know, you just have- No, but here you're using- Tesla's orbital field. field. You, know, here, you just here. need that to increase linearly with the applied field. But here you're using A, the orbital field again, not the Z. No, 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 Pierce. I, I was not, not little, very Not little here, A, right? you're using big A. No, no, here is pure spins. Jordan Wigner Fermi's. Take the XXC model. There's no electron, no nothing. It's pure mm -hmm. spin model. Right, but if I look on the bottom right-hand side of your uh, figure, you've got the orbital I, field. I, I, I made a mistake. This actually should be little a. I'm trying to explain in this cartoon what is the meaning of the field mm. that Jordan Bigner Fermions experience. But it's a pure spin model. There is no electrons here. So, you know, Jordan Bigner Fermions, if you want, you know, you can map them to free particles, right? And you can just do the exercise of sitting down. What is the correlation function that, you know, that, what is the correlation of, of the particles? In that case, the Zeman coupling for is... Jordan Bigner Fermions that corresponds no, But in to that the case, the coupling field. of the external field to the Jordan Bigner Fermions is just a, a B dot sigma. Exactly. There's, no, there's no orbital component. Exactly. It. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just same. And that's what I was trying to say. Right. So there won't be anything like a one over B kind of, you've got to- All you need to explain is why the Jordan Bigner Fermions form a spiral. Mm. Mm. So that's the physics, the microscopic physics that I'm still missing. I'm not trying to say I solved the problem. You know, I haven't really given a good explanation what is the microscopic origin of the field, but it mm -hmm. could be something, I'm not trying to say it's literally a spiral, but some kind of local correlation. Like Your the theory spiral. predicts it's a Zeeman coupling. Yeah, I, I'm imagining that everything in the end emerges out of some kind of pure Heisenberg model with some Zeeman okay. coupling. Very good. Okay. Did, did He Young still want to ask a question? I mean, that would be the last question. 
Yes, go ahead. Okay, good. Uh, I thought that we don't have much time. But anyway, um, so I was thinking that isn't that possible these oscillations are not really an oscillation, but rather than a transition from one ton number to other ton number or something like us? Some... Yeah, very good that you asked this question. I actually have an answer for that too. Yeah, so you could ask, you know, what happens with these quantum oscillations at very low temperatures, right? So, you know, the spin of four Landau levels, you could ask, you know, when I put the chemical potential in the gap, is the spin liquid still stable? You know, whatever spin liquid descends of what would be the parent pseudoscalar spin liquid state. It turns out this spin liquid is a bit more fragile than the usual spin liquid because the usual spin liquid, you know, if I just have one component of a spinons, right? I, I just have some finite churn number. So the, 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 the state that you have when you put the chemical potential in the gap would be like just the spin on analog of a, of a quantum hole state. So it would be a chiral spin liquid. But this one, you know, by the same symmetry reasons that you don't have hole effect, you will not have the turn Simon term for the gauge field. So basically this, this spin liquids don't have chirality, right? So they, once you have the, once you gap out the fermions via Landau quantization at very low energies, because you're in, if you're in strict two dimensions, they should eventually confine, okay? So I think actually that this, this phase of matter, if it's really there, eventually at low temperatures should confine. So the quantum oscillations are some intermediate behavior in a sense. So eventually, liter, what temperature scale is in the end, I don't know. Exactly, but as a matter of principle, if you really preserve this symmetry, they will eventually confine, but that means that the, the eventual low temperature state should be just an ordered state. So this is, you know, this is spirals might lock. So you actually have some, some, some actual ordered state, okay? Which is actually, no, no, you know, this is spin on confinement, right? So, so, so then the oscillations might evolve into a sequence of complex phase transitions. Okay. So, right. so, so the, the, the oscillations could be an intermediate phenomenon that eventually evolves into. Well, let's thank NT again for a beautiful talk.